Hi, I'm Glenda Watson Hyatt, a middle-aged white woman with short red hair and blue eyes, and I'm wearing a bright orange blazer. I am using my iPad to communicate. I'm a Master's of Applied Science student at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, although I am actually located in Surrey, British Columbia, where I am privileged to live, work, and play on the unceded, ancestral territory of the Kwandalan, Katsi, and Tsimiamu peoples. Mm -hmm. Today, I welcome the opportunity to present on the topic, Equity and Communication, Workplace Universal Design. Imagine you are advancing as planned in your chosen career when an injury or illness leaves you unable to verbally communicate as you do today. Your other abilities, skills and knowledge remain intact. Does your employer accommodate you on your current advancement track? Or create another position for you better suited to your diminished communication ability? but beneath your expertise and at a lower pay grade? Or do you become another Canadian with a disability facing an unemployment rate of 51%? That rate is as high as 86% for people with communication disabilities. In comparison, 21% of Canadians without disabilities are unemployed. To provide context about this segment of the disabled community, the prevalence of speech disability in Canadian adults 15 years old or older is 1.9%, nearly four times the number of Canadians with a developmental disability. Some speech disabilities occur early in life, such as with cerebral palsy or autism spectrum disorder, while others are acquired later in life, such as after a stroke or with multiple sclerosis or oral cancers. Unique barriers to employment leave this group financially dependent, socially isolated, and personally unfulfilled. A method is needed to assist employers in understanding how to effectively include people with communication disabilities into the workplace. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, signed and ratified by Canada, recognizes communication as a human right. We all know that people with mobility disabilities have a right to physical access within the built environment, and, in the same way, people with communication disabilities must have communication access, the means, supports, and opportunities to communicate effectively. Both the Employment Equity Act of 1995 and the recently enacted Accessible Canada Act aim to identify and remove barriers in employment. To comply with the ACA, employers will need to adapt in recruiting, retaining, and promoting these Canadians by January 1, 2040. Universal design is a proactive mindset approach benefiting all in the workplace and increasing the need for individualized accommodations for employees with disabilities. Further research is needed to consider how communication access can be extended to a universal design approach. The Six Sigma Engineering Data-Driven Quality Strategy define measure, analyze, design, verify, will be used to apply universal design principles to promote equity in employing people with communication disabilities. The overall objective of this two-year project is to develop a universally designed framework to enhance the processes of recruiting, retaining, and promoting individuals with communication disabilities. The short-term objective is to understand the current state of affairs in terms of employers' awareness and knowledge of communication disabilities and the barriers to employment within the employer's purview. In terms of work to date, the first step, defining or identifying barriers the employer can control or influence, has been completed. A systematic review was used to answer the research question, what are the barriers and facilitators 
to accommodations in the workplace for adults who use augmentative and alternative communication, or AAC. In this study, which is currently in the publishing review process, 17 studies met the inclusion criteria. However, most of those studies were conducted in the United States and had small sample sizes that did not represent the diversity of the AAC community, which limits generalizability. Also, many were published more than 15 years ago, which, therefore, may not reflect advancements in technology that impact use of employment accommodations today. With those limitations in mind, the systematic review revealed an extensive list of personal and environmental barriers. My research is focusing on barriers within the employer's purview, which include inaccessible workplaces, fast-paced environment, and supportive of time required for alternative communication strategies, challenges related to interactions and relationship building with colleagues, underestimating skills of people who use AAC in the workplace, fear of increased financial costs, lack of awareness of and experience with accommodations, and lack of knowledge of relevant legislation. Moving to the analyze phase. In response to recent social injustice events, the Privy Council Office of Canada, the department that supports the Prime Minister and Cabinet, issued the call to action on anti-racism, equity, and inclusion in the Federal Public Service on January 22, 2021. 90 deputy heads responded by letter, detailing the action their organizations have taken to date. A sample of 29 letters was analyzed to determine actions undertaken to increase inclusion. It is important to view these letters as a snapshot in time rather than as detailed reports of accessibility and inclusion initiatives undertaken. Also keep in mind that private and many public sector employers have been legally obligated to accommodate employees with disabilities up to the point of undue hardship for the past 26 years. Initial analysis of these 29 letters shows that actions relevant to employees with disabilities include establishing accessibility champions, advisory committees, and employees with disabilities networks, creating accessibility action plans, reviewing policies, programs and initiatives using gender-based analysis plus to identify systemic racism and barriers to accessibility and disability inclusion, piloting the Government of Canada's Workplace Accessibility Passport, committing to include universal accessible washrooms in their workplace retrofits, and offering a medical exemption to the Official Languages Training Program for employees for whom learning an additional language would be problematic. Moving forward with this research, the next step is to survey and interview public service sector managers responsible for recruiting, hiring and retaining employees to determine current awareness and understanding of communication disabilities and how to include them in employment equity initiatives. I hypothesize that the current knowledge of communication disabilities is limited to including individuals with hearing and sight loss and to those requiring alternative formats. As the medium-term objective is to create tools to use in recruiting, hiring and retaining people with communication disabilities at the design stage, a framework with explanatory materials will be developed. And lastly, feedback will be elicited from people with communication disabilities and their allies on the framework and accompanying materials to verify the content accurately and appropriately reflects their unique barriers when seeking employment. Necessary revisions will be made in an iterative manner. Nearly half a million Canadian adults are living with speech disabilities. Developing a universal design strategy to promote equity and employ in these individuals would tap into an underutilized labor pool. Increasing the employment rate of this segment of the disabled community could result in thousands of Canadians with communication disabilities 
being employed, increasing financial independence, meaningfully contributing to society, and, hence, improving their overall quality of life. I'd like to acknowledge this research is funded by Government of Canada's Accessibility Standards Canada Research Grant. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at glendalwh at gmail.com. Thank you.